before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Nicola Machiavelli was a Florentine diplomat, author, philosopher, and historian who lived from 1469 to 1527. The name Machiavelli in our modern times has come to mean one who works with no integrity and does unscrupulous acts to get what he wants. In 1513, Machiavelli wrote a political book called The Prince. It is said that this book was inspired by none other than Cesare Borgia. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a big thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. If you would like to help support the channel and join our Patreon or our producer community, there is a link down in the description box below. All right, you guys, we are continuing today with history's first crime family, our look at the scrupulous Borgia family. If this is your first time joining us, I have already covered Rodrigo Borgia as well as Lucrezia Borgia. Those videos will be down in the description box below. Today, we are going to be looking at the person that I believe is the most scandalous, the most salacious of all the Borgias, and this is Cesare Borgia. I labeled this episode the bad boy of the Vatican and the inspiration for Jesus. We're going to get into all of that. Um, as you guys might have noticed, we are not using the monitor today. There's been some issues with my sound in the monitor, so I decided for this episode that it was more important for you guys to be able to hear clear audio than to see a clear video of me, because this video is not about me. It's about Cesare Borgia, so it's going to be basically in podcast form, which I assumed was okay for most of you guys, since I know a lot of people, like myself included, when we listen to episodes or shows on YouTube, usually we listen to it as podcast anyway. So um, with that being said, I sacrificed the monitor to the gods of YouTube so that we could hear the vocals more clearly for this one episode before I can get get it fixed. Um, and for those who don't have a sense of humor, that was a joke. Of course, there are no sacrificing to gods. It's literally just a joke. So don't, don't take that too seriously. With Cesare Borgia, I have said this before, um, there's something just very sexy about Cesare Borgia. I know that might sound weird because he lived 500 years ago, but Cesare Borgia, in my opinion, was probably the first ever historically popular bad boy. And if you're like me, you've probably dated quite a few bad boys in your life. And um, Cesare Borgia, like, like his siblings, was known for his good looks. And obviously, he was known for doing whatever it takes to get the job done. There have been many uh, adaptations of the Cesare family, including the Showtime series with Jeremy Irons uh, that lasted three seasons. And the guy who plays Cesare Borgia in this particular Showtime series, in my opinion, to me looks the closest like the paintings that we see of Cesare, and he was quite good looking, or is quite good looking. So I can definitely understand why they casted him as Cesare Borgia. The interesting thing about the Borgias, again, is that with each family member by themselves, they're probably 
no more corrupt than anybody, any other noble at this time period in Renaissance Italy. But you put them together as one family, and that's when they become notorious. I've said this in our, in our previous episodes, you really can't talk about one Borgia without talking about the whole entire family. And even though the Borgias did do some pretty heinous things, as we spoke about with Lucrezia Borgia, in my opinion, as a human being, and as somebody who loves psychology, I can't help but wonder if there's more complexity than we realize with, these, with this family. Again, they were probably at the highest of power being the Pope and being the children of the Pope at this time. And we know that the, these uh, aristocratic or no, noble families, it was like a dog-eat-dog -dog environment. And so part of me wants to kind of take some of their actions with a grain of salt because honestly, what would we do in that situation? If, if you're fighting for your life in this Game of Thrones, would you do things that you normally wouldn't do given the circumstances? I don't know. I thought that was just kind of a fair question to ask, something for all of us to think about as we discern our way through some of these historical figures. And of course, something to think about when we discern our way through some of the world leaders that we are currently dealing with. So with that being said, let's get into Cesare's story. Cesare Borgia was born on the 13th of September, 1475, right outside of Rome, Italy, in the Papal States. He is the son of Rodrigo Borgia and Rodrigo Borgia's chief mistress, Vonaza. Now, we've talked about this before in other episodes. I'm not going to get too far into it in this episode. You can go back and listen to the, the previous episodes. But you might be kind of wondering why a cardinal, who would eventually become the Pope, had children. Well, again, at this time period, it was very common for cardinals and for popes to have children. In fact, most of the popes had children. They were considered to be illegitimate, obviously, because cardinals and popes were not allowed to marry. However, the legitimacy of a pope's child or illegitimacy of a pope's child was very different in this time period than the illegitimacy of a, a peasant's child. These children of cardinals and popes were hierarchy. They were treated like princes and princesses. They were, they were very, very high value, high stock. After all, the pope is the most powerful person in all of Europe. And so Cesare was not the first child of uh, Rodrigo Borgia. Rodrigo Borgia himself had 11, about 11 illegitimate children, obviously illegitimate. Most of them did not live very long into adulthood. We're going to talk about some of them, some of the other children, when we get to Giovanni or Juan Borgia's story, Cesare's brother. But nonetheless, Cesare, Giovanni, also known as Juan, Lucrezia and Joffrey are the four Borgia children who made it into adulthood and lived long enough to be a part of these this family's scandals. In my research, somebody said something I thought was quite interesting, a, a very astute observation of the Borgias. They were a family bound by flesh and blood and corrupted by power. One of the uh, people I listened to the uh, podcast and, and going deep into the Borgia said, you know, and I agree with this, this person, that sometimes we look at historical figures and again, we see them just as these nameless, faceless people who just did things, just as facts. But these are human beings. And at the end of the day, they're a family. And whether you like your family or not, they're your family. The people that you call your family are the people that know you the best, that are bound to you, karmically and physically bound to you. And again, in this environment of Renaissance Italy, in the nobility, I just wonder sometimes, again, at the complexities of this scandalous family, if, if, you know, if we were in their shoes, what would we do in order to survive? But nonetheless, so Cesare Borgia was born on the 13th of September, 1475. Now, the order of children goes Cesare, Giovanni, who was called Juan, Lucrezia, and Joffrey. 
Now, there are some debates between uh, the order of birth between Cesare and Juan. Juan was his nickname. Most people, it seems, do believe that Cesare was the oldest child, but some people sway to the fact that maybe Juan was the oldest child. They were only about a year apart. In my opinion, and I'm not, I'm a lay person, I'm not a historian, but in my opinion, Cesare was the oldest child. And that's just because Cesare absolutely gives oldest child energy. Cesare Borgia was, you know, for all his faults, he was very organized. He was very on top of things. If he said he was going to do something, he did it. Whereas Juan was more of the wild child. He was more of the partier. He, he definitely had that second child energy. So just so you guys know that going into this story, again, there is a debate between the order of birth. I tend to follow the line of thinking that most historians follow that Cesare was the oldest. From childhood, Cesare was groomed to work for the church. He studied at many different universities, many different universities, but the most notable university that Cesare studied in, studied law in, is what today is called the University of Rome. And this is one of the oldest universities in the world. Now, again, at this time, when we're talking about law, as we've said in multiple other videos, at this time in history, canon law or church law and civil law were one and the same. So I did some digging, a little bit of digging into the University of Rome, and I found it very interesting that the University of Rome was founded in 1303 by Pope Boniface VIII. So it was a university actually established by the um, establishment, we'll say, the, the powers that be. The Pope established the university in 1303. In 1431, so just before the birth of Cesare, Pope Eugene the fourth reorganized the school. He raised the tax on wine to fund the university's four different schools, which were law, medicine, philosophy, and theology. Interestingly enough, as of 2016, it is still ranked among the top 3% of universities in the world. Now, something that's very interesting about the educational system at this time period too we talked a lot about Lucrezia's private education, but we can look at like Cesare's education. And I've talked about how education changed in our modern times when the Federal Reserve took over. That's when education kind of went to hell in a handbasket. Before that, and of course this was long before the creation of the Federal Reserve, children were taught very com complicated um, subjects at a very young age. Most children learned at a very young age how to speak multiple languages. They learned, of the nobility, that is, of the upper class, they learned how to read dead languages. And they ta were taught things like philosophy at a very young age. Now, when I was looking at this information, I kind of go back and forth on whether some, of, some philosophy is appropriate for younger children or not. Um, you know, we do know now in modern times that the brain goes through stages of development, so some philosophy m might be better off taught when a child is old enough to understand it. But nonetheless, I just think it's interesting that from, from the time he was a child, he was taught philosophy, Aristotle, Socrates, all these great philosophers, and taught to ruminate over their theories. And I can't help but wonder if his, at his young age, learning this philosophy is what turned him into the Machiavellian prince that he became. You know, with philosophy, there's never a direct answer. It's not like math or science. You don't have a direct answer. It's more a, a, a manipulation or a thought process and theory. And I love philosophy. You guys know that. That's, I, that's what I do. My job is out, outside of work is, or outside of YouTube is, is Eastern philosophy. I teach Eastern philosophy and I love it. I love being able to, to live in the gray and to contemplate things. But for somebody as smart as Cesare Borgia, who comes from very smart people, that, that high intelligence, it just, I don't know, it's just something to think about with, with the fact that he was taught, trained so early on in his life and, and these heavy theories, was that part of what created the monster that he became? I, I don't know, just something to ponder. 
By 15, he was made the Bishop of Papalona. By 17, the Archbishop of Valencia. At 18, in 1493, a year after his father had become Pope, he became a Cardinal. This was an elevation given to him by his newly again appointed father as the Pope, Rodrigo Borgia, who became Pope Alexander VI. He also at 19 became an abbot. And the tension between Cesare and Juan was apparent from the very beginning of their lives. Again, they were very close in age, only a year apart. And it was very clear that Rodrigo Borgia decided that one of his sons was going to be in the cloth and the other son was going to be in the military. So one son would be rank and power in the church and the other would be in the secular world fighting for the military. And of course, Cesare was the one that was designated the role of, of the cloth, of father, following in his father's footsteps, whereas Juan was given the role of being in the military and living within this secular power. Well, Cesare and Juan, as they say, as most children do in a lot of families, uh, very much competed for their father's affection. There was always tension between the two brothers. It is said by many historians that they believe that Juan was actually favored by Rodrigo Borgia. Now, I don't know where they're getting that information. It seems to me that the, the child that really was around his father the most was Cesare. Maybe that was because Cesare was always trying to win his father's approval. I, I don't know. But nonetheless, I can definitely believe there was tension between the two. Again, Cesare was the more organized child. He was definitely, again, giving that first child energy. Whereas Juan was, was the partier. Juan was not as um, reliable. And a lot of times, Cesare did have to bail his brother out of situations, would have to go find his brother. His brother had the propensity to end up in, I have to be careful how I say this, but he would end up in houses run by the ladies of the night, if you guys know what I mean. And so, you know, and that, that wasn't abnormal back then. Uh, culturally, at this point, people had a very different uh, attitude towards intimacy. But Cesare, not only was he had this competition with his brother for his father's affection, but he also, it seems like, had to kind of parent his brother as well. We also know that Cesare was very affectionate towards Lucrezia and Joffrey, Joffrey being the youngest. And of course, as we spoke about with Lucrezia, there were rumors and speculation that um, Cesare and Lucrezia had an inappropriate relationship. We're going to get into the, the more salacious and scandalous stuff a little bit later on, but you guys are probably aware of all the rumors between Cesare and Lucrezia. So Juan was the captain general of the Vatican's military. And again, this was a point of contention because Cesare would have preferred to have switched places with Juan to be the one who is in the military, in the secular world. We know that Cesare Borgia from, from diaries that he did not believe in God himself. He was not a God-fearing man, which of course, if you've followed along with these videos, God does not exist in the Vatican anyway. The Vatican was very much a political entity. Juan and Cesare both shared a mistress. Of course, they had many mistresses at this time, but oddly enough, the mistress that they shared was a woman named Sancha of Aragon. And Sancha of Aragon was actually Joffrey, their youngest brother's wife. Sancha was also the sister of Lucrezia's second husband. Now, Sancha might even warrant her own episode because she's quite an interesting character herself within this Borgia saga. But nonetheless, even though in this time period people had many different lovers, there probably was a lot of jealousy between Cesare and Juan over Sancha. Sancha was considered to be a beauty, just like Lucrezia. And she came from a very, very powerful family. Now, you might be wondering why Joffrey wasn't jealous of his brothers. Well, that's because Joffrey was very, very young when he married Sancha. And so his awareness of the intimate nature of marriage probably wasn't, was not there yet. And he probably had no clue that his wife was banging both of his brothers. In 1497, Juan goes missing. So Giovanni Borgia, again, his nickname was Juan, he goes missing. 
And he ends up literally swimming with the fishes. A lot of people in the that are in the Borgia's realm end up swimming with the fishes. Again, as I said, with Rodrigo Borgia, the Borgia family is allegedly the inspiration for the Godfather. They might literally be the first mafia family. So he obviously had been assassinated. It is widely believed by many people that Cesare was the one to do it. Cesare was an assassin in a lot of incident, incidents. Basically, he was responsible for acting out the hits on people that his father had made. Now, with that being said, there's also speculation that putting Cesare's name out there as the one who did it might have been propaganda even back in that time. Because the Borishas had a lot of enemies. They had a lot of enemies. There literally could have been anyone who was responsible for the unaliving of Juan Borgia. To this day, his, his unaliving is still considered an unsolved mystery. Who, who unalived Juan Borgia? But once Juan Borgia was unalived, it, it, does, it is stated that Rodrigo Borgia, the father, he was Pope Alexander VI at this time, did go into deep mourning at the loss of his son, which as psychotic as this, as this family is, it's kind of nice at least to know that Rodrigo Borgia was at least um, upset over his son's passing that shows some amount of, of fatherly, fatherly affection. So that is, you know, silver lining, right? Silver lining. But with Juan being gone, now Cesare Borgia has, not only does he have Sancha, his sister-in-law, to himself as his mistress, but he also now can potentially step into a secular role of taking over Juan's place in the Vatican military. On the 17th of August, 1498, Cesare Borgia becomes the first person in history to resign from the College of Cardinals. Now, interestingly enough, um, he petitioned to leave and the Cardinals didn't want to let him leave. You know, even though the Borgias were hated by many people and the Vatican itself was very secular and the way it behaved and its political entity, part of me thinks they didn't want him to leave because when you are a Cardinal, I think you are bound by more limitations. And they did, they probably knew how evil Cesare could be and if keeping him a Cardinal maybe reigned in some of that evilness and I don't think they cared about him being evil to other people more to themselves right like more to the diabolical nature and the briberies going on amongst the employees of the Vatican the Cardinals themselves I also think because Cesare was the first to petition to resign they didn't know what to do with that no one ever had resigned before so I think it was kind of like a deer and headlight situation where they were like what is this possible? I didn't know you could do that. So anyway, the Pope, his father, supported him resigning from the Cardinals. And so, of course, what the Pope wants, the Pope gets. So Cesare Borgia resigned from the Cardinals. At this point, he does become the Captain General of the Vatican's military. And as Billy Carson says, why the hell does the Vatican actually have a military? That's questions you've got to ask yourself. Like, why... Why would they have a military? Because it's not about God, right? It's a political entity. Cesare Borgia was really living his best life as a military man in secular power. He, obviously, being a cardinal was definitely stealing his sparkle. He sparkled like a diamond being a warlord. He was made for, for the bloodlust of war at this time. And he very quickly became the most feared warlord of his day. Louis XII of France actually made him a duke. And Louis XII of France, as we spoke about with Rod Rigo Borgia in his episode, a lot of these kings, because the kings were technically underneath the Pope in ranks of power. So a lot of these king, kings and queens would, would do favors for the Pope in order to get what they wanted. Again, this is why it was advantageous for popes and cardinals to have children, because the children th then became bargaining pawns for bribery. Now, King Louis XII of France, see, he, there was something he wanted. 
he wanted to annex Brittany in northern France onto France. Now, the only way he was going to be able to do that was going to be through a politically arranged marriage. But there was a problem. There was a problem because Louis XII was already married to a woman named Joan of Valois. So, what to do? So, Louis XII gave Cesare Borgia a title of Duke in France in order to sway Pope Alexander VI, Cesare's father, Rodrigo Borgia, to annul his marriage to Joan of Valois, leaving him open to marry Anne of Brittany. By marrying Anne of Brittany, that would annex Brittany on to France. So, if you are from, from Brittany in France, you can thank Rodrigo Borgia for the fact that you are French. So anyway, he made him a duke, and they upped the ante by saying, listen, we will arrange for Cesare to marry this princess named Charlotte. Now, Charlotte was the sister of John III, who was the king of Navarre. Now, Navarre is in the Pyrenees Mountains. We've spoken about Navarre before, and we talked about um, Catherine de' Medici, another Italian who became the last uh, queen of the House of Valois, and her nephew or cousin by marriage, Henry IV, who was from Navarre, and him taking the, thr the throne of of France, which created the, the Bourbon line, which is all, you know, the Sun King, all, all those, you know, they were the Marie Antoinette, the people that were on the throne when the French Revolution happened. So Navarre was kind of a part of France. They were all part of the same family, but it was, it was on its own principality in the Pyrenees. So there was connection, obviously, between this, the throne of, in Paris, the, the, the king and queen of, of France, and the king and queen of Navarre. They were family members. So Louis the, the Twelfth arranged for Césaire to marry Charlotte, the sister of John III, who was the King of Navarre. So technically now, Césaire is married into the French royal family. Now, Navarre is interesting as well in the Pyrenees. The Pyrenees are, I, I actually want to do some deep dives into the Pyrenees because that's where a lot of the Basque people are located as well. And they're all O-negatives, I'm O-negatives. It's a very mystical part of our, our world. I've been there before, but I was a lot younger, so I didn't take the opportunity to really enjoy being in the Pyrenees. But because it's the mountain chain that divides France and Spain, obviously there's a lot of warring over territory in the Pyrenees. Even to this day, a lot of communities in the Pyrenees Mountains speak a combination of both Fran French and Spanish. And so bringing Cesare Borgia into the French family line in Navarre, it's going to kind of set up a conflict here. We've got a conflict now with Spain. And if you guys remember, the Borgias are actually a Spanish family. Rodrigo Borgia himself was godfather to Ferdinand and Isabella's oldest son. Rodrigo Borgia was also the one that gave dispensation for Ferdinand and Isabel to get married, creating Spain as we know it today, because before that it was Castile and Aragon. So that marriage brought Spain together. And now we have this chunk of land in the Pyrenees that's still owned by France that, you know, they're warring over this land. They're constantly trying to take the land from each other. But now Cesare Borgia is married into the French line, royal line, and is a feared warlord. So it looks as if the papal, papacy is supporting France. France and not Spain. So you see how things get complicated. This is like a really sh crazy shit show, Melrose Place. Everybody's boinking everybody. Everybody is stepping everybody in the back. They're all the same people just kind of going around and being just brats to each other. Like it's really very petty, very petty. But nonetheless, this is going to set up Cesare for eventually what is going to be his downfall. So he married Charlotte on the 10th of May, 1499. He got Charlotte pregnant and then left to support the French king in the military. So a deadbeat dad, basically. Now, he had multiple other um, children, illegitimate children, but he only had one le legitimate child with Charlotte, and this was Louise Borgia. Now, oddly enough, there is still a line, a modern-day line, coming from Louise Borgia, and that's Prince Sixtus Henry of 
Bourbon Parma. He's like 85 years old. He's old now, but I'm sure he's got his own kids. But he is a direct descendant of Cesare Borgia. Now, I'm sure that there are other direct descendants of Cesare Borgia out there in the world. But back in this time, illegitimate children weren't tracked like royalty was tracked. So the reason why we know he's a direct descendant of Cesare Borgia is because the lineage has been, there's been records of the lineage of this royal family. So when Cesare Borgia went to support the French king in the military, his, his in-laws basically, this became known as what's called the Italian Wars. And Italian Wars lasted from 1494 to 15. 99 and these wars were basically control for the peninsula of Italy. So again as we said with uh, Rodrigo Borgia's episode at this time the peninsula known as Italy today was not a country. It was multiple principalities, multiple duchies ruled by different families. So again you had the kingdom of Naples, you had Florence, Milan, Venice, they were, these were all different, basically their own little countries, like a republic. And so with the peninsula of Italy, we have a lot of agriculturally good land. And agriculture means more produce. More produce means more money. So these principalities of Italy are constantly at war with each other. Many of the people that ruled the Italian peninsula in these little principalities were not Italian themselves. Like the Kingdom of Naples was ruled by the Spanish family for a very long time. That's how the Borgias ended up in Italy. And just also know, think about this historically in the, in the big scheme of things. So this was in the late 1400s. Well, you know, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. So this is on the eve of this new world, this new continent, a way bigger continent than Italy, that now these empires are going to be fighting over. If you are an American, think about that, our history here in America. Before the American Revolution, we had Spain, France, England, the same people, the same empires were going to war over who controlled the American continent as well for the same reasons, because of agriculture because of the land that was very advantageous to product. It's the same thing. So again, what's happening in Italy is going to now happen in the American continent very soon. Same principles. So the Italian wars were basically that. It was these different empires, the French, the Spanish, going to war for portions of this peninsula in order to produce harvest to get more money. For their empire. So with Cesare Borgia now aligned with the French royal family, this was advantageous for Rodrigo Borgia because the more land that Cesare Borgia conquered with the French family meant that the Borgia dynasty had more European power. I know some people might be confused when they hear that Cesare Borgia all of a sudden was in this military expedition to take over Italy when his father was the Pope. But that's just the point precisely, is that now Cesare Borgia, who is an extension of his father, since his father is the Pope, and can't, has to remain somewhat, somewhat neutral, even though they're taking bribes like crazy, Cesare Borgia now can claim these holdings for the Borgia family. Right? Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So during the Italian Wars, Alexander VI, though his dad, Rodrigo Borgia, went so far as to depose the vicars in northern Italy. This was to grant control of that land to Cesare. Now, interestingly enough, I thought this was kind of funny. So they say that when the vicars were basically fired from being the vicars of northern Italy so that Cesare Borgia could be the boss man, be in control, even though Cesare Borgia is quite a notoriously evil person, the, the, the people of northern Italy were really happy to have Cesare Borgia as their new, their new um, landowner, basically, because apparently the vicars that were there before Cesare were even worse than Cesare. <laughs> so that just shows you how fucked up things were back in those days. So 
yay, I guess. He, he did something good for the people of Northern Italy. Uh, he became the head of the papal army. Again, why does the papacy have an army? But nonetheless, he became the head of the papal army. He then received the title of the papal gonfalonier from his father. Now, the Vatican obviously is worth a lot of money. And this is why, again, popes and cardinals at this point in history could not get married because their children could not, they didn't want their children to be able to inherit the wealth of the Vatican. They, they, the powers that be wanted to keep the establishment, wanted to keep the power and wealth of the Vatican consolidated to the actual Vatican. But nonetheless, nonetheless, my friends, when Pope Alexander VI, Rodrigo Borgia, was pope, he took a lot of the Vatican's money and put it into Cesare Borgia's military expositions. So all the money the Vatican had through the payments to the Vatican from the peasantry, taxation, all that kind of stuff, went directly into the pockets of the Borgias in order to expand their land grab. Not much has changed, has it, my friends? Our taxes today are supposed to go to our own countries, to fixing roads and all that kind of stuff, but we know it doesn't. We know it goes elsewhere. So not much has changed. At this point, Cesare Borgia goes full mafia, where he is literally putting hits on lots of people and being full mafia. He's putting in them all in the river to swim with the fishes. They're being drowned. He is hired, he hires the Orsini family to help him. The Orsinis then kind of go against him, and it's just a lot of petty stuff. Again, you guys, I just want to reiterate too before we go even further. As many of you know, I'm not really interested in military history. That's not my wheelhouse. And so when we talk about these historical figures and we look at wars and military, I'm just going to skim the surface. Unless there's something super important about a particular war that needs to be brought up in this person's story, we're just going to skim the surface with military expositions because that is just not my wheelhouse. It's not something I really understand. But if you are interested in the military history of Cesare Borgia and the Papal Army, there are so many wonderful historians on YouTube who will go into great detail about these expositions. So I would highly suggest watching their channels. You can just put in the search bar Cesare Borgia military expositions and you'll find plenty of channels that can go over the history of that for you. Um, again, that's just not my wheelhouse. So in 1503, we had a come to Jesus moment. <laughs> the worst thing possible happened that could have happened to any of the Borgia. Well, maybe not Lucrezia. Maybe this was actually a good thing for Lucrezia. But for Cesare Borgia, this was like the worst thing that could have happened. Alexander VI, Daddy Pope, Rodrigo Borgia dies. Now, as we said in his episode, historians today still don't know whether he passed away from malaria or poisoning. I think we know which one of the two. Common sense, common sense, my friends, that motherfucker was poisoned. I think we know full well that he did not die of malaria. He had so many enemies, and, and poison was a huge weapon of choice back in those days. So at this point, Cesare himself, oddly enough, was in, in recovering from malaria himself. So he had been very sick as well. At the same time, he recovers and he learns that his father has passed away. So his father is the seat of power, right? His father was the pope. Well, don't fear because the next pope is a guy named Pius III. Now, this pope was a huge supporter of the Borgia. So who, right? Like dodged a bullet with that one. He is total support of Cesare Borgia's expedition, but you know what they say, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Pope Pius III only lasted 26 days on the throne of St. Peter before he himself died. Uh-oh, because next we have Pope Julius II, and Pope Julius II hated the Borgias. Oh, man, karma's a bitch, isn't it? Karma will surely turn around and bite you in the ass when you least expect it. So we got a new pope who hates the Borgias. And the pope, my friends, as we said many times, is the mightiest land man in all the land. So Julius is also kind of unscrupulous in the way that he works. And he does a little trickery with Cesare Borgia. 
He tries to convince Cesare that, no, 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 it's okay, my friend, I'm going to support you. But it's all a manipulation for Julius to then strip Cesare Borgia of power and of land. Now, with that being said, Cesare Borgia is still married to the sister of the king of France. So technically, and he has a child with this woman. So technically, he still isn't bad off, right? He's still royalty. Around this time, the Spanish king also takes advantage of Cesare's bad luck. When Cesare realizes that he's being duped by the new pope and he's having his titles and his lands stripped from him, he tries to tuck his tail between his leg and seek the assistance of Ferdinand and Isabel. You know, the people that asked Rodrigo Borgia, his father, to be the godson of their oldest son um, and then... Cesare married their arch enemies, and so he goes to Ferdinand thinking he can like mend the fences and like get back to their old chummy days of being family friends, but no, 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 no. Ferdinand knows how to hold a grudge. Ferdinand imprisons Cesare for a year. A year, Cesare is kept under lock and key in Spain. But never fear. Because you remember who Cesare's brother-in-law is. Cesare's brother-in-law, again, again, is King John III of Navarre. King John III of Navarre to the rescue. He, it's, 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 it's super important for him to get Cesare out of jail because Cesare is such an incredible, I mean, again, the guy was super evil, but you can't take, there's certain things you can't take away from him. He was a military genius, Cesare Borgia. He was a military genius for most of his life, not at the end, but for most of his life. So even though this guy is your brother-in-law, he's your sister's baby daddy, really what John III is looking for is getting Cesare back so that he and Cesare can continue to recapture land for Navarre in the Pyrenees. So Cesare Borgia is brought back into the Pyrenees with his brother-in-law. Now, on March 11th, 1507, I'm going to set the scene here, you guys. March 11th, 1507, it's early, early in the morning. It's thunderstorming. Think about those days, guys, when you're laying in bed and it's just thundering and lightning. It's raining super hard. For me, I want to stay in the bed. I think that's super relaxing. But nonetheless, there were enemy knights that were had been captured in the castle where John III and Cesare were located in this battle, this scuffle between France and Spain, this ongoing scuffle between France and Spain. And these enemy knights decide to take advantage of the fact that it's heavy thunderstorms. So they escape from the castle using the weather, the elements of weather, to hide themselves, right? When it's loud and it's thundering and lightning and it's raining hard, you can't really see where anything is. You can't hear the horses. And so Cesare decides that's not okay. He's like, hell no, you guys didn't just try to leave this castle. You're our prisoners now. So Cesare goes chasing these knights. And Cesare gets lost. Oops. You know, how humbling is that? Here's this guy who is a really great at military, he's a really great military man, so I'm assuming he was really good at directions. And in this moment of weakness, he gets lost and he ends up alone. Like all of his posse has somehow, he's gotten lost from them. And the enemy knights take advantage of the situation. And so they ambush Cesare and they spear him to death. At this point, they strip him naked of everything. They take all of his jewels, and they even take off his leather mask. Now, this is something I haven't mentioned yet. Cesare Borgia, by the time of his death, on the 11th of March, 1507, he was 31 years old. He was riddled with syphilis. Now, at this point, many people were riddled with syphilis, but what they would do because of the disfiguration is they would wear a leather mask. And so this, this man, who is considered like the hot guy of the Vatican, very good looking, the ladies man, the bad boy, you know, now was what had to wear a mask because he was so disfigured from this STD. So they strip his mask off of him. The body was literally found with a red tile covering his genitals. So they, you know, again, karma's fair play, right? Now, 
his brother-in-law, King John III of Navarre, built a mausoleum for him at the Church of Santa Maria in what is northern Spain. The tomb itself was destroyed between 1523 and 1608. The body was actually moved and placed under the street so people would walk on it. That's how much, that's, I mean, this was well after he had passed away and people were still so scarred by Cesare and the Borg. I mean, I'm sure they also were scarred by the Borgias in general. And so they moved his body, put it under the street, just to have a little chuckle that he was being walked on. In 1945, they decided to exhume the body. So they exhumed Cesare Borgia's body, and they studied it, and they checked the DNA to make sure it actually was Cesare Borgia. And then they decided to put his body back. His body did stay at a local community center for a while, but they put the body back, and they actually buried it on the property of the church. So it's not in the mausoleum that was created for him, but it's nor is it under the road anymore. It's actually in a respectable place. Now, again, there is a lot about Cesare Borgia that obviously I have not spoken about in this episode. There is the Jesus picture. There is the banquet of chestnuts that happened at the Vatican. There's also, of course, the rumors about him and his sister. Now, because of these topics, because of the, the, because of the theme of these topics, I cannot comfortably talk about these topics on YouTube. So what I have done is I have created a, an extended uh, again, an extension of this episode over on Rumble. And on this episode, we're just going to be talking about the Jesus picture, his relationship with Da Vinci, and the banquet of chestnuts. So if you go down into the description box below under show notes, you will see a link to the extended part of this episode over on Rumble. Now again, this episode on Rumble is not, there. these are two separate episodes. So on YouTube, I basically got kind of the brief story of Cesare Borges' life. And then over on Rumble, we're going to be talking about the scandalous, sensational stories that Cesare Borgia is notoriously known for today in our modern times that we can't talk about here on YouTube. Now, some historians do talk about this stuff on YouTube, but you guys know I'm watched and I get shadow banned a lot. So it's just safer for me to put those things over on Rumble where I can speak freely. Again, if you are in a country that does not have Rumble, I think it's France and Norway, and you would like this episode. You would like to see the extra part of this episode. I think that, that that's an hour as well, uh, about 45 minutes to an hour over on Rumble of the second part of this episode. Then just send me an email at esotericatlanta at gmail.com and put your country in the subject line. And just in the in the email itself, just let me know. Just put Cesare Borgia or something, and I'll, I'll notice and send you the copy from Rumble so that you can see the extended version of, of these um, these escapades that our friend Cesare. I get tongue-tied on YouTube, you guys, because my brain knows what I want to say, what what the word is, but then I have to stop myself because I can't say the word because it's YouTube, and so I, I, I can blank out. like I don't know what to say because I have to think of a pretend word for, you know, the hokey pokey or whatever we're talking about. So it's nice to actually have a backup channel like Rumble where I can talk about the legitimate without having to worry about watching, censoring myself or watching what I'm saying. So obviously with the second episode over on Rumble, I would also be very cautious with your children. Um, if, of course, that's totally up to you. You're the parent. But if you have young children around, just know that we're going to be talking about very adult topics um, so just be mindful of that. And anyway, guys, so I will see you over on Rumble for the rest of this episode.